Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to another talk in our Leading at Google series. My name is Joel Constable, and I work in leadership development as part of Google EDU. And I'm excited today to introduce our newest speaker in the series, Joseph Grenny. Over the past 20 years, Joseph has taught and advised more than 100,000 leaders on all continents. He is the co-author and contributor to eight different books, including three New York Times bestsellers, Influencer, The Power to Change Anything, Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High, and Crucial Confrontations, Tools for Resolving Broken Promises, Violated Expectations, and Bad Behavior. Today, Joseph will be discussing his newest book, Change Anything, The Science of Personal Success, Please join me in welcoming Joseph. Thank you. Well, let's see. I'll use that so it'll carry to the back. Do you hear me okay back there? Okay, good. Well, thank you. It's exciting to be here. And uh, this is the, the week that the book launches. So uh, uh, those of you who do product releases on a regular basis, this is our product release. And it's exciting to be able to share some of what we've been working on for the past few years with you. Uh, my goal is pretty ambitious. I, I want to accomplish something that you may not think possible in, uh, in an hour. I'd like you to leave with a new brain. So uh, my understanding is that you arrived at Google because you got a pretty good one already. But I want you to leave with one that is capable of something entirely new. And in order to accomplish that, I'm going to need you to get a little bit more engaged than you usually would. So you're going to need two things, a writing instrument of some sort, electronic, manual, whatever you got. So if you get something handy, I'm just going to have you do a couple of very brief, very focused little tasks. The second thing you're going to need is a learning buddy. So if you'd, uh, you'd look to your left, right, front, and back and find a reasonably intelligent person, uh, buddy up. Then, uh, then you'll have everything you need for this to be a, an extremely useful experience to you. Great. Okay, good. So if you all got a learning buddy and a writing instrument, I think you're in good shape. Let me kind of set the context for, uh, for the topic here to start with, and then I'll, uh, then I'll get you busy here. So first of all, let me ask you to, to raise your hands if you identify with any of these scenarios. So first of all, how many of you know more about wellness, relationships, parenting, financial planning than you currently do? How many of us fall into that category? So we all, we all have sort of knowledge that exceeds our current practice at times in some areas of our lives. It affects our, our personal lives, but let's talk professionally as well. How many of us know more about leadership, career management, professional effectiveness than we currently express in our habits as well. So we identify with that also. So the, the theme here is that very often understanding is insufficient. It's what we can translate into habits in our lives. How many of you know other people whose primary obstacle in their career or life is their own behavior? Any of us know people like that? Don't point at them, just I'm asking you to think about them. And finally, how many of us know an organization, not the present one, but how many of us know an organization that could be significantly more successful if people would just behave a little bit differently? We encountered that same dynamic. So this is the topic for today. The topic is that the greatest challenge we face frequently is not just the learning, it's the translation of what we understand into habits, into behavior in our lives. The primary reasons, I'd contend, that individuals fail to live up to their potential often isn't the lack of ideas. There are a lot of ideas out there. It's a lack of behavior. It's a lack of being able to translate that into practice. The primary reasons organizations often fail is not because we don't have a great strategic direction or a good product concept, it's the execution of it. It's developing habits and behavior that are going to support the leveraging of that concept. So let me step you back for just a second. We started uh, 25 years ago together studying human change. About five years ago said we want to look at just the individual. So we're going to separate you today out from your organizational context and say, what about just you personally? And we found as we talked with HR professionals, for example, across the world, that there are a whole lot of Thomases. Now, this is a puzzling thing because here's Thomas. Thomas was described as one of the most loyal employees in his entire organization. He was described by colleagues as somebody you'd really want to have at your left or right in a crisis. When things get bad, this is somebody who rolls up his sleeves and really gets the job done. But secretly, behind his back, his colleagues would also tell you 
that the guy can't manage to a schedule. When there's not a crisis, you can't count on him to get something to you on time or on budget or on spec. So that's, that's Thomas. Now Thomas got a new supervisor. And his new supervisor decided she was going to start coaching him in a way that nobody had prior to this. So in year one, in his performance review, she said, you really need to learn to manage, to be a little bit more predictable. And he was very motivated to change that. So he started working on it, but was unsuccessful. Year two, she said, you really need to work on this or you'll lose your job. This is important, Thomas, pay attention. In year three, he lost his job. So this was an interesting scenario to us because here you've got a guy who has incredible motivation to change. I mean, your job is at risk, right? You really do want to change, but, but doesn't change. And that's what we've been studying for the past five years. By show of hands, how many of you believe that you have enormous control over your own behavior? How many of us believe that that describes us, that we have great control over our own choices? My purpose today is to convince you that you don't. <laughs> So what I want you to get, and if I'm successful, what you'll walk out understanding is that you have a heck of a lot less control over your behavior than you think you do, and that's why these Thomas stories are so frequently the case. Now let me take you to a whole different scenario. So I want you to meet Michael Vitale. About four years ago, when we started the line of research that led me to talk to you today, we met a whole number of people, I'll describe them in just a moment, like Michael. I want you to listen to his story here. Michael, I uh, had a change challenge. Well, my, my story starts back when I was a, a very young man. I was hopelessly addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, I, I got in serious trouble, everything from um, legal trouble, financial trouble. Um, I lost everything that I owned, all my personal possessions, um, my car all my CDs, everything that was important to me in terms of my, my material possessions gone. Um, relationships, I, I, I lost a woman that I thought I was gonna marry um, and you know she, she couldn't handle my alcoholism. Um, my family, I, I lost the love and respect of my family and the people that mattered to me and um, I wound up morally, spiritually, emotionally bankrupt. So Michael ends up in prison in Arizona uh, for a 12-year sentence, I do in large measure to some of these habits in his life. And so when I, when I listened to Michael's story, I had to ask myself the question, this is a 20-year story, right? This wasn't a fast thing. Thomas' story was a three-year long saga as well. The question I put to you is, at what point do you think Michael wanted to change? At what point do you think Thomas wanted to change? You see, the, the challenge here is, that all of us believe that if we just want it badly enough that we have control over our behavior so we ought to be able to change. We're all caught in what we'll call later the willpower trap. We believe that willpower is the predictor of our capacity to change and yet when you look at our lives we find that many of us have problems of the physics that you see in Thomas's and Michael's. What I found is that there were 20 rock bottoms in Michael's 20-year story. There were many, many, many points along the way that he said, I've got to change this. This hurts too bad. I've lost this. I'm going to change. I've lost this. I'm going to change. But then he didn't change. The, the definition of a change problem that I'd like to propose is a situation where you know you ought to change. In fact, you even want to change, but you don't change. And all of us have those. All of us have some area in our lives where we're being kept from something that we'd really like to achieve in our career or in our relationships or in our personal life because we're unable to overcome that kind of a dynamic. And what does it cost? Well, the fact that we can't handle this particularly well affects us in our employment situations. 87% of employees in one of our studies suggested that they'd suffered economically because of their own behavior in the workplace that they were unable to change. Financially, we suffer. When we ask how many people feel like you're on track for a, an eventual retirement, about one in five say I'm where I ought to be. Relationships are the same. It turns out that even those who seek advice rarely benefit from it. I can listen to a counselor that says do this differently and your relationships will go better, but our capacity to absorb that into our lives is fairly low. And finally, you look at health. Now, I want you to think about this from the willpower perspective again. What a remarkable statistic. 90% of those who wind up in the hospital for coronary bypass surgery because habits in their lives have led them there, are back to the exact same behavior within just a couple of years 
of going under the knife. Could you define or design a more motivating opportunity for somebody than open heart surgery? I mean, these are people leaving the surgery who want to change, know they should change, but don't change. So what I want to do is challenge our naive assumption that just wanting it is what it takes to change, that hitting rock bottom is the predictor of our capacity to break out of this. So about four years ago, we threw a question out to the universe. The question was, are you struggling to change some habit in your life? And 5,000 people raised their hands and said, yeah, yeah, I am. And then we followed their stories over a period of years and said, who succeeds and who fails? About 4,400 of those failed, or at least their failures in motion. So they're still struggling, but haven't conquered whatever the behavior changes that they were attempting to bring about. A few hundred, however, succeeded. And so what we wanted to do is to say, what can you learn that differentiates and even predicts who ends up in category two versus category one? Well, there were three principles, two of which I'll have a chance to elaborate on a little bit today, three principles that had a remarkable predictive power to them. In fact, we, uh, we later published some of this research in the MIT Sloan Journal, and what we were able to demonstrate is that the practice of these three principles predicts at 10 times who succeeds versus who fails. Those who practice these principles are 10 times more likely to find themselves changed in a profound, measurable, sustainable way versus those who don't. So that's what I'd like to share. Here's the first concept. The first most important thing to get into our heads when we looked at those who succeeded at change was they broke out of what we came to call the willpower trap. The willpower trap is, is sort of the assumption that this is the mode that change works in. So we, uh, we crunched a whole lot of our numbers, developed a, a really sophisticated computer simulation to demonstrate how you and I tend to approach change, and here's what resulted. Millions of dollars, folks, there it is. <laughs> how many of you identify? <laughs> so we, we've all been on that, right? When we tend to approach change, we see it as this struggle against some mighty opposition. And as long as we dig our heels in and hold against it, we can stay over in the good category. But as soon as you relax your grip, you get dragged back in the other direction. Well, here's your first assignment. So with your learning partner, I want to share with you a little laboratory experiment we did with uh, 11 and 12 year old children. We wanted to, to subject them to, to, to a variety of sources of influence and see how they'd respond, but then also see if they were aware of what was going on. So with your partner, I'd like you to watch the experiment and afterwards just articulate what are the implications for change in this study. So if what we're suggesting here is true, what are the implications for how you and I think about change? Here you go. This, by the way, was conducted by my son Hiram for a science fair project, so uh, you'll meet him in a moment. Most of us are just one habit away from being much happier, healthier, or wealthier, but we can't change. And if you ask the average person how much control they have over their own behavior, they'll tell you a lot. If that's true, then what's our problem? Why is it that almost all of us know we should change some habit, we even want to change some habit, but we don't change that habit? Conventional wisdom is that we just lack the willpower. Well, I wanted to find out. I wanted to see if success is all about personal motivation. So I gave a group of 10-year-old kids a chance to earn $40. All had big plans for the money once they left my lab. Well, I was wanting to get a new video game. Maybe a new pair of shoes. College money. Wait till Christmas comes and then buy my sister a really cute outfit. Clearly, they were all very personally motivated to earn and keep their money, right? Here's how it worked. Over the course of 10 minutes, they would complete four easy tasks. After each task, I'd give them $10 and a chance to spend it or save it. The only temptation they'd face is a bunch of overpriced junk at my Change Anything store. So we've got kids who really want to save. They only have to resist temptation for 10 minutes, and the only temptation they'll get is obviously a terrible deal. How hard could this be? Let's see how the first subjects do. Wow. 
Wait a minute, what happened? In spite of rip-off prices, these kids were spending like it's bonus day on Wall Street. In fact, this group only saved an average of $13. A few of them even went into debt. What happened to those grand goals to save money? Snickers is my favorite candy. I can usually get it at $1.50 at a store. But since it's my favorite candy, I bought it for $6. And what about this poor kid? $10 again. In the end, all but one of these well-intentioned savers failed. Why would they pay so much to get so little when they only had to wait 10 minutes to achieve their goal? I don't know. There was like a lot of good stuff to buy. I'm not sure if I can answer that question. Sounds like a willpower problem, right? I paid six dollars for it because it didn't come me cheaper. <laughs> Well, not so fast. Picture it this way. It turns out that I'd lace their experience with six powerful sources of influence, the same kind you and I face in the real world. And these guys are experts at pulling us in directions we don't want to go. In fact, each one of these behavioral bullies worked against my would-be savers. Here's how. Everyone got to taste a free sample of their favorite candy. Yummy. Nobody taught them how to track their expenses. They were surrounded by bad examples and negative peer pressure. You know, there's a lot of awesome candy over there. Dude, you should get a lot. It's much awesome. <laughs> they spent from a credit account, which made the spending feel easy. Just grab whatever you want to buy. And finally, there were lots of enticing pictures on the walls. I think you adults call that marketing. Wow, these kids never had a chance. I paid $4 for this, but I don't know why. I wish I paid more. But the real problem is bigger than just being outnumbered six to one. These kids were blind to all of it. Why do you think it was so hard to save your money? I don't know. To be sure I could attribute their disappointment to these sources of influence, I changed them for the second group. I got them working for the savers rather than against them. No free samples. I taught them how to track their expenses. I turned accomplices into helpful friends. I'm gonna save my money. How about you? I think I'm gonna save my money. I think it'd probably be a good idea. I paid them in cash so they'd feel immediate loss when they bought something. And I took down all that marketing mumbo jumbo. Okay. A new group of kids with the same jobs, same pay, and the same opportunity to buy from my Change Anything store. Now let's see what happens. Success! These kids walked away with 260% of what the first group saved. But what do these subjects attribute their success to? I don't know. I don't know exactly, but... Because I'd rather save it, so I can have it later on. I just thought I shouldn't buy any more because my goal was $30 and I wanted to keep that goal. I needed the money. Hmm. Turns out these kids were just as blind to the positive sources of influence as the other kids were to the negative ones. So what's the problem with that? Well, if you don't know why you succeeded, you won't be able to fix your failures. And that's just it. My dad and his colleagues discovered that there are six sources of influence all around us all the time. And they have enough pull to determine our behavior and therefore our results. And if we can't see them, we can't change them. So when they're working against us, we're blind, outnumbered, and doomed. So what's the point? If we're struggling to change tough habits, we may not have a willpower problem, but a math problem. The numbers are simply stacked against us and we don't even know it. But if we can learn to see and engage all six sources of influence on our side, change becomes almost inevitable. Just think about it, getting what we really want out of life, wouldn't that be great? And it's a whole lot better than the alternative. I didn't want to spend too much so I could reach my goal, but at the end I kind of bought a little more, so yeah. Isn't that remarkable? 
Did you, did you catch the difference in the savings amounts between the two groups? What was the increase in the second group? Yeah, 260%. This is remarkable. These aren't subtle little differences. These aren't small. These were profound differences. What I want you to do, though, with your partner is just sort of articulate what are the implications of this for how we think about change. So just take 60 seconds and what sort of leaps to you as, uh, as an implication of this research? All right, sorry to interrupt, but let me, uh, let me pause you. I wanted to kind of get your wheels turning on that so we can kind of uh, explore and apply for just a second. I want you to notice in the experiment we held willpower constant. So the assumption is the willpower capacity of the two groups was precisely the same, but the outcomes were entirely different. The, the, the central argument here is that willpower is not a particularly good predictor of whether we succeed or fail at change. There's something else going on. If that's true, then this is one of the, the implications. The problem very often, not all the time, but very often is not that we're weak. The problem is that we're outnumbered. The problem is that it isn't just sort of some magical rope that there's some invisible opposition with. There are definable, knowable, identifiable sources of influence that are on the other side of that rope pulling us in the other direction. The problem is not a willpower problem, it's a math problem. And it's that we're secondarily blind to the math problem. We're over, overwhelmed by these opposing sources. So, so here's the upshot. One of the things that predicted people succeeding at change is their acknowledgement of that second point. Those who were in the, the, the second cohort, the ones who succeeded at changing habits, started to gain an awareness that they had far less control over their behavior than they'd like to tell themselves. What they did acknowledge, though, was that they could have enormous control over the things that control them. And that's where they turned their attention. It was less just about saying, grip my teeth, grunt hard, and pull. It was more about starting to become a student of what was happening to my own behavior, learning to sort of appreciate and identify some of those sources of influence. So here's the challenge. It's making the dynamic move from that to this. The question is, how do we marshal those same forces on our side of the rope? And that's when these people started to turn the corner. That's when they were not just marginally more successful at change, they were 10 times more likely to be able to produce change. So let me give you a little quick opportunity to, to play with the concept. Let's imagine for a moment that you're a sales professional. And what you've figured out is that if you start your day hitting some of the toughest calls that you have to make, your sales increase. So that's what you ought to do. You really ought to organize your day so that you hit the phone right away, making some of the important contacts for that day. However, on this particular day, you started your day instead of making phone calls with two hours of chatting with colleagues, checking out news websites, and organizing your calendar before starting on your leads. You ended up blowing the whole morning and not getting much done. I'm sure programmers never have this problem, right? So all of us have felt that same dynamic. The question I want you to answer, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to do it. All I want you to do is off the top of your head with your current brain, answer the question, why? So why, when he intended to start his day, with all of those great calls, did he instead witter, uh, fritter it away in the way that I just described? So turn to your colleague, first answer off the top of your head, why did it happen? All right, okay, I want you to put a pin in that answer. I want you to hang on to it for a second. So let me get, let me get one answer. What's one reason I might have done that? It's too hard to make the call, so I Okay, it. good, good. He says, I put it off because it's too hard, it's not fun, I don't really want to do this. What would be one more reason? Okay, good. So I was just procrastinating, just putting it off, again, kind of because it's unpleasant. Let me just get one more. How about from you? Lazy. lazy. All right, I was just too lazy. Now, what I want you to notice, and sorry about the gotcha, but I want you to notice that almost all of our expo explanations for my failure fall into what we just called the willpower trap. What we just did with our current brains is explain my behavioral lapse by saying I just didn't want it badly enough or I wasn't strong enough to overcome some of those urges and impulses. Does that make sense? That's the problem. That's the problem. When we try to explain our failures, we do it in terms of a motivation struggle. Let me broaden and make this a little bit more complex. What if it's possible that personal motivation was an issue? Okay, let's just acknowledge that. So it is more fun not doing these calls than doing them. So calling leads fills me with anxiety. Watching kitties fall asleep on YouTube is fun. So I'll do something more pleasurable. Got it. But what if there were also ability reasons for it? For example, I don't know how to change the lethargic feeling I have when I sit down at the computer. Could that be a skill gap in part? 
Are there emotional management skills that I might lack? What about social? You know, is it possible that my colleagues are also part of the problem? So they come around and we have fun together and we laugh and they encourage that sort of distraction and, uh, and diversion. I mean, is that a possible part of the problem here? What about others who don't just sort of encourage but also enable? People knock on my door, they send me IMs as I'm psyching myself to get started. There are positive interruptions for other, from other human beings. Do you see the problem here? The problem is far more complex than just I didn't want it badly enough. We've perfectly organized the world to make it so that you won't. What about incentives? Turns out for this particular person, when he makes a big sale, he relaxes for a while. There's not as much of an economic incentive to continue pounding the phone because I feel okay for the month. And what about structurally? Notice how few of us identified this one. It turns out that as I sit at my desk getting ready to make phone calls, there are five kinds of distractions that are piped right into me. Do any of you ever notice that in your work? I can get instant messages, texts, mobile phones, emails. There are a million other distractions just a click away. We have perfectly structured our physical environment to create distraction today. But when you try to explain why I didn't make my calls, all we tend to look at is, well, you didn't want it badly enough. That's the point. That's what we've got to learn to get past. Here's why. Because when it comes to these six sources of influence, you literally have only two choices. You can either act on them. You can either identify the ones that are working against you and marshal them in your favor, or you can be acted on by them. If you don't do the former, you will experience the latter. You will be controlled and shaped by these to the degree you're not conscious of and taking action to try to move them on your side. So point one. Point one is that we have to break out of this simplistic model that we carry in our brains about human behavior that attributes disproportionately our choices to willpower, to how bad we want something. That's an ingredient, but it's far less than you might think. Here's the second. The second big difference between the successes and the failures were sort of the mode with which they approached their change challenge. We called this becoming both the scientist and the subject. Now you already do this. You're already pretty good at it, but we don't tend to do it as systematically as we should. In fact, I, I saw kind of a fun naturalistic exp uh, example of this. Just a while back, uh, this was at Vital Smarts. I was standing in front of a group like this. We took a break and I saw a, an email come through on my phone and the email said this. It said, hey everyone, a set of keys was found in the downstairs refrigerator. If they are yours, come find Becky. Now this is vital smarts. I, I get the sense the Google culture is kind of, uh, kind of similar. Uh, I knew that with that kind of a setup, there would be a dozen smart aleck uh, emails that would follow after this one uh, coming from people poking fun. So I waited and sure enough, the first one came through. Um, can you please tell us whoever it is that claims them so we can make fun of them? Thanks, Joe, sent to all of the employees at vital smarts. Followed this one was, if you keep them in the freezer, they last longer, just saying, from Platt, very helpful <laughs> suggestion. Followed by, it's not me, I only keep my keys in the second or third floor refrigerators, from Rob. So as these were all kind of coming through and I was enjoying and appreciating them, then finally the, the mystery was solved. Uh, Emily wrote in, she says, they are mine. I put them on my leftovers so I won't forget to take them home with me at the end of the day. Isn't that clever? How many of you do something like that? How many of you use some sort of a... My, my biggest problem is when I stay at hotels, I always forget my gym clothes because they're hanging over the towel bar in the bathroom trying to help them dry out a little bit. And so a few years ago, I realized Joseph is too stupid to remember to get his gym clothes, so you'd better do something to trick Joseph into remembering. So I go get a laundry bag out of the closet, lay it across my garment bag, and that reminds me to go get my gym clothes and bring them... Does that make sense? What we found is that people who are really good at change start thinking of themselves like a lab rat. They start thinking about themselves in the third person and saying, I know a little bit about me and here's what I have to do to get me to behave differently than I otherwise would. Here's a fun illustration. So one of our 600 changers was Charmin Went. Charmin was struggling to lose 120 pounds. She tried for 20 years to shed this weight and she'd make a little progress and then slip backwards. And over time, she got so sort of defeated because of this willpower trap issue that she gave up. But then something happened inside of her and she started looking at herself and learned a few things about what had caused failures and, and then was able to say, what might I do to predict success? Here's one of the conclusions she drew. She said, at the 
The final time when she approached her weight loss challenge, she said, I never promised to always keep my diet. She said, I think that was one of the things I got wrong. I would make some absolute promise, and then as soon as I would break it, I'd feel horrible and depressed, and then I would give up. So this time I didn't do that. But then watch what she did. She said, I did, however, make an unequivocal promise to myself that before I broke my diet, I would read a three by five card that I carried with me. That was my promise. That's all I promised. And then after reading that card, I would make my choice about whether to break the diet or not. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is the way she's thinking about herself as the object of study. She's carefully sort of working through what the failure paths were and then starts to say what interventions would help this person called Charmin to behave differently in the future. See, here's why this became so important in uh, these people's success stories. Because social scientists may have studied a category of change that you care about, whether it's changing your spending habits, improving a relationship, advancing your career. So there are books out there that will say, here's what we know from a study of 2,000 people in this category. The problem, however, is that the idiosyncrasies are more important than the commonalities. That the differences between you and that average person that was studied are more profound than what you have in common with most of them. That's the difference between social science and physical science. And no one has ever studied you. No one's ever done it. So that diet book probably doesn't apply 90% to you. That relationship book may not have a lot to say to you. So you have to do the research. You have to be the scientist. You have to do the first ever study of an N of one of a person called you and figure out what is unique and idiosyncratic about your choices and your behaviors and how then would you use that to trick you into behaving differently? How would you do that? In order, however, to do that well, you need a model. You need a way of both understanding as well as influencing your own behavior. These changers that we studied eventually succeeded, but many of them took a few years to get there. What we hope to contribute with the Change Anything book is to shorten that learning cycle, to help people have an explicit model that they can use to study their own behavior and therefore create interventions that are remarkably successful and remarkably fast. And here's the model. So what I'm going to do in the remaining time we've got is fly you through that. I'm going to have you sort of play with it as scientists, and I want you to notice how easy it is to overlook various elements of the model. Here's the first. The first element that we often misunderstand or fail to use is the one that is the trap we fall into. So it's the personal motivation source of influence. The problem we often have in attempting to change is that bad habits feel really good and good habits don't feel very good. Is that true? So very often the unhealthy behaviors are very personally motivating. The question then that you and I have to ask is, is the only solution digging in our heels and resisting those impulses? Is that the only way to approach this? What we found is that successful changers almost never take that tack. They use tactics to help them literally change how they feel about both the bad behavior and the good. Let me share with you a little experiment. I need you to get with your buddy. So with your partner, you need to decide who is person A and who is person B. Pick an A and a B. There's no big strategy to this, just a simple assignment, go for it. All right, so all the person A's, raise your hand if you're person A. Okay, good. If you're person A, you now have $10 in your hand, okay? It's an imaginary $10 I've given to you. So uh, you have $10 in your hand. Person B, you are going to get an offer from person A. This is called the ultimatum game in, uh, in behavioral economics, if any of you are familiar with it. So person A is going to offer to split that $10 with you. He or she can offer you anywhere from zero to $10. After they make the offer, you are going to either accept or reject their offer. So if I offered you $1, you could now either accept or reject it. If you accept it, you get $1, I get nine, and we're done. If he rejects it, neither of us get anything. We both lose. Does everybody understand the rules? Okay, so person A, I want you to decide how much you're going to offer right now. And as soon as I say go, you turn and make your offer. And then person B, I want you to immediately either accept or reject it. Okay? So person A, give it some thought. Give it some thought. Figure it out. What's your offer? Okay, ready, set, go. Make your offer. Okay, good. Accept or reject. All right, how many of you rejected the offer? Did any of you reject it? Just got one. How much did he offer you? One dollar. 
Now, it's interesting because a rational person would do what? What would you do? Accept or reject a dollar? It's a dollar more than you would have had a moment ago, right? But something in us gets us to reject it because you're a creep, right, for offering me only one dollar. <laughs> There's something else going on here, something value-driven. Now, this is the interesting experiment that was set up by Lee Ross at Stanford. We did a replication of this a little while back in a mall, had people play the game. And in that game, we framed it two different ways. I want you to listen to how subtle and small these differences were. In round one of the game, we called it what you see on the sign here. We said, you and your colleague here are going to play the Wall Street game. And you are going to decide how much to offer to your opponent. You follow? In round two, we called it the community game. You and your colleague will be playing the community game, and you have to decide how much to offer your partner. Do you think just changing a couple of words would change the outcome? Yeah. Yeah, it was remarkable. 60% more people offered even splits when we just called it the community game. You and I were willing to give up money, which can feel physically painful to us. <laughs> We're willing to surrender money if we just have a little different mental frame for the choice that we're making. It's remarkable. So how does this work? Remember the problem. Bad habits feel good. Good habits feel bad. So how do changers deal with that problem? Here's what Sharman did. Sharman promised that before she broke her diet, she would read a little card. That's all she promised to do. Now, Sharman's biggest downfall was chimichangas. Sharman loves chimichangas. She said she'd be sitting in a restaurant and would see chimichanga on the menu. And a whole train of mental and physiological processes would start to take place. Her mouth would water. She could recall the melted cheese, you know, and the, and the tasty, delicious, soft pork in the middle of the... She hadn't even ordered the thing yet, and she's already experiencing the chimichanga. So this became her crucial moment. And in that moment, she said she'd made a promise that she wouldn't always keep her diet, but she'd read the card. So she'd retrieve this three by five card and she would read line one. Line one said in her own penmanship, I'd like to feel healthier. And then she'd take a breath and she'd pause. And then she'd read line two, which said, I'd like to like the way I look in the mirror. And she'd take a breath. And then line three, I'd like to have more physical stamina. Line four, I'd like to model healthy living for my grandkids. Line five, I'd like my husband to be proud of how I look. She said somewhere between lines three and four, something strange would happen inside of her. She said the chimichanga felt different. She said somewhere in there, suddenly, she would not want the chimichanga quite as much as she did before. Now, this didn't work every time, but frequently it was the case she felt differently towards the chimichanga. She says, in fact, later on as she worked with this, she would actually feel disgust for the chimichanga. It would feel like a sellout to her. Is that possible? Yeah, not only was it possible, it was remarkably predictive. Now, I want you to notice what she just did. Not only did she succeed in losing 120 pounds and has kept it off now for many years, what she did was she acted like a scientist studying her, trying to figure out, could I create an intervention that would change how I felt about my choices in crucial moments? And then she developed one using a tactic we call creating a personal motivation statement. What we describe in the book are 22 different tactics that people seem to sort of stumble upon. They eventually discovered that helped them accomplish things like this. So if we have professional challenges, we often have habits and behaviors that are tough for us to change because they're emotional barriers. We have emotions we have to change, but the truth is that it is possible for us to use little interventions like this to help us change how we feel, to love what we hate, to have different feelings towards positive and negative behaviors. So that's one. The second area where you have to be a pretty good scientist is illustrated by this. So with your partner, I want you to help out Mary Gordon. Mary Gordon was concerned about proactive bullying that happened in schools. So proactive aggression is defined as not just we're mad at each other so we push each other, but somebody who seeks somebody out as a victim and targets them for punishment. So she wanted to try to have an influence on proactive aggression in schools and in fact was remarkably successful in over 12,600 classrooms. 
So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to your partner and I want you to come up with one thing that you would do if you were a school principal to try to reduce bullying in your school. How would you get bullies to stop doing that? One idea, ready, set, go. All right. Okay, now I want you to examine the idea you came up with. So I don't, I don't care about the content of the idea, and you're not going to be probably moving anywhere with that. I want you to notice what category of influence we tend to rely on. So when we're explaining my, my ineffectiveness at making sales calls, we tend to look at motivation. I want you to notice if the idea you came up with had to do with compliance, accountability, punishment, holding them to, you know, uh, giving them some sort of consequence. And what we tend to do very often is move in the motivation direction. And that's not what Mary Gordon did. Mary brought kids who were struggling with proactive aggression into a classroom with a baby, the little infant, and she taught them skills. She just had them practice just reading the expressions of the baby and trying to, to label how the baby felt. How is the baby feeling right now? Put a word to it. She taught them skills for recognizing and identifying a baby's behaviors and then taught them skills for changing a baby's behaviors. She tried to coach them so that they would have strategies to try to both understand other people's emotions and relate to them in a different way. The consequences of this and a number of other interventions were remarkable. 88% of those who had struggled previously with proactive aggression stopped and three years later stayed stopped. Here's the point. The point is that, that new habits almost always require new skills. The issue here is that there are emotional, interpersonal, mental, and physical skills that when we're in the, in the throes of bad habits, we tend not to develop. But when you and I try to approach change, we almost never look at the ability side of the model. We think it's primarily a motivation issue when we run ourselves down that side. So think about Michael Vitale, the guy I introduced to you earlier. 20 years of drug addiction. Most of us would say that Michael will finally give up drugs when he's motivated enough, when he wants it, when he hits rock bottom, right? That's the predictor. Well, baloney, because it turns out that over 20 years, he had crafted a whole set of skills that helped him to be an addict. And if I asked you to make a list, if we had time, it's an interesting exercise. There are quite a few. You have to be a world-class liar. You have to be a pretty competent thief. You have to be pretty good at identifying drugs, at mixing drugs, at negotiating for it. You're going to have to work out where you're going to sleep at different times. He got really good at dumpster diving over this period of time, and that is a skill. It's an actual skill. Where would you find food when you had no money? Over time, he had crafted a whole set of skills that adapted him perfectly to a certain lifestyle. He had none of them for the corollary lifestyle. Absolutely none. And what you and I do is say, well, Michael, when you want it badly enough, you'll succeed over there. No, it doesn't work like that. What happens is he wants it badly enough, he tries, fails, and then says, this is the only life I'm competent for. Well, what about Thomas? You know, Thomas has a four-person production team and he's not meeting schedules and budgets. He was fired for those chronic inabilities. What we know is that there were skill gaps. It wasn't just do you want it badly enough, Thomas, it's do you have skills for organizing, planning, holding people accountable, holding crucial conversations when necessary, or a whole variety of things that people who are good at this tend to be able to do. What we know is that any attempt to motivate the unable doesn't create change, it creates depression. And you and I tend to approach change with a motivation first kind of an approach. Now let me move to the last couple of categories here very quickly. This is A.J. Wagner. She had a two-pack-a-day smoking habit and was struggling to try to change. I want you to listen to something that was common in the narratives of most of these people. I've always been a daddy's girl. I spent most of my childhood idolizing my father, who's a heavy smoker. And um, one of the things I needed to do was limit my exposure to smoke. And so our long talks in a smoking environment, we're going to have to come to a screeching halt. And our long talks on the phone with both of us on the other end smoking, we're going to have to slow down as well. And it wasn't a difficult, it was a difficult process rather. It wasn't easy at all. And it hurt a little and we tried to maintain communication. We didn't sever the relationship, but it was obviously strained for a while and there was a lot of question and answer as I tried to learn how to have a conversation. And ultimately we've come through the rough times. We, we speak 
relatively regularly. We still love one another, but the relationship had to change in order to maximize my own personal change and my own health needs and the subsequent health changes that have happened in my husband and children and hopefully grandchildren in the future. And interesting. Well, one of the things that many of them recognized is that, that bad habits are a team sport. That there are almost always other people that are playing a role in my continuing to behave the way I do. Some of them may not even be conscious of the role they're playing. You don't have to have an agenda to have an influence. So, what almost all of them experienced was they had to change the mix of what we call accomplices and friends in their lives. Accomplices are those who are either enabling or encouraging the bad habits, and the friends are those who are supportive of the positive change. Now again, I'm not going to have any time to elaborate on this, but I want to illustrate how subtle sometimes the social influences can be. Bob Muse was struggling to lose about 150 pounds, and he didn't even realize that he should struggle for many, many years because, well, well, let me explain why. Here's how he discovered he shouldn't. One day he was on Google Earth and saw a new feature called Google Street View. And on Google Street View he said, I want to look at Longwell Green, England and see my house. And so he went to his house and he said there was this looming massive structure in front of his house that he didn't quite recognize. He said that the image was grainy enough that he wasn't sure what and who it was until he finally recognized it's me and I'm huge. He said it was at that moment when he realized he could be seen from outer space <laughs> that he thought, I probably have something I ought to address here. Very often, you and I sort of blend into our environment because those around us are modeling the very behavior that we're struggling to get out of. He didn't know he was overweight because everybody around him was overweight. Everybody at the pub looked just like he did. There's a, a problem today of awareness about many of our bad habits because there are accomplices that model things around us. One of the things that we hope you get out of the book is the capacity to start differentiating the roles people play and how to get them on your side in support of change. Here's the last. The last category of influence I want to address I'm going to give you as a problem to help me solve. So this is one of our changers who's had his third heart attack. His name is Jim. Jim was told after his first heart attack that you need to change your diet or you're going to have another heart attack. And he did for about a week. And then he started slipping back in the other direction. And then he had a second heart attack and he changed his habits again for about a month. And now he's had his third heart attack. So he comes to you and he asks for one piece of advice. How can he help himself change his eating habits forever? What's one piece of advice you'd give him right now off the top of your head? So share that with your partner. All right, good. So again, I want you to lock that in your, uh, in your mind right now. Remember, my original goal was I want us to have a different brain. I want us to have a different way of thinking about these problems. So I want you to notice what category of influence you just drew upon. So if you had a suggestion for how to stay motivated, that's a good one. If you had a suggestion about ability, that's a good category. If you had a suggestion about social influence, that's a whole nother one. How do you get people on your side and supportive? But if you didn't have this category of influence, we miss one of the most simple ones to go after. So a colleague of ours, Brian Wansink at Cornell University, uh, sort of inspired this experiment. We brought a bunch of, uh, of kids together, had them play soccer for an hour and a half till they were good and hungry, and then afterwards brought them in for a, a wonderful feast of macaroni and cheese. We randomly assigned uh, the 14 kids to either one table or another, as you see. And I want you to see if you can notice a difference between the plates. I understand this is common knowledge at Google. It's a good thing for you to be aware of. So one table had plates the size of hubcaps. <laughs> the other had these petite little plates about uh, three inches smaller in diameter. Do you think that would make a difference? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, now I want us not just to think about plates though. I want you to generalize. At the conclusion, we asked all the kids, are you full? Did you get enough macaroni and cheese? Every one of the kids said, I'm full, I'm happy. They weren't denying themselves. It wasn't a struggle. And then we weighed the two bowls to see what the difference was in consumption. One table ate 73% more than the other table, and both groups of kids reported being equally full. Now here's the problem. We learn something about plates, but we don't generalize it. So Thomas understood that his physical environment affected his relationships and therefore his ability to hold people accountable and finish his work on time. In his subsequent job, he became a scientist. 
he began trying to apply that knowledge to his own behavior. So what did he do? He started changing where he ate lunch. He started eating where his colleagues ate. That changed the quality and strength of his relationships. That helped him deal with issues a little bit more effectively with them. What you got to learn to do is control your space. Now the problem is that very often we're blind to the effect our physical environment has on our choices. Do you catch the irony? <laughs> yeah, this is from Google Street View probably. <laughs> Most of us riding the escalator up are unconscious of the fact that I'm about to go stand on a treadmill for 45 minutes. I mean, what, what, where's, the, where's the sense in this? Our physical environment subtly and invisibly shapes our choices. So what do you have to learn to do? You got to learn to see it. You got to learn to see ability gaps, social influence, structural influences. If you use tools and fences, cues, autopilots, distance, there are things we can do in changing our environment. The best piece of advice you could have given Jim about his third heart attack is get smaller plates, use smaller spoons, make some physical changes because it immediately affects our choices. And it isn't just around consumption. It's around every category of influence that we need to go after. So what do we have to learn to do? We've got to develop tactics that help us deal with personal motivation challenges. You better address ability gaps. You better get social influence working on your side. You better deal with incentives. That's a category we didn't address today. You better deal with the physical environment and how it affects your choices. That's what's causing us to fail. Most of us know we should change, want to change, but don't change. And we're hoping that access to this kind of science helps us to understand a little bit more our own choices and take control of those. So thank you very much. I've got a couple more minutes for questions, and I would be happy to address anything you got, and I appreciate you being here today. Any questions or comments? Happy to entertain anything you got. Yes? Yeah, he says, uh, is the economy in large part based on people not understanding these principles? I think so, but the people who do understand them are the people trying to exploit that opportunity. So the economy is kind of perfectly organized now to help us sort of be subject to a lot of these sources of influence. And unless we're kind of armed the same way, uh, yeah, we're, it's an unfair fight. And yeah, I think that's an important point. Other questions? Yes? Say again? Yeah, this is an insightful question. Uh, he says, is it just as difficult to see the good influences as the bad influences? I, I did a, a lecture on this a little while back, and a woman said, well, I quit smoking, and I just went cold turkey, and it was all willpower. And I said, congratulations. That's, that's great to hear. And after hearing more about the model, she said, oh, I, I now realize that the fact that my husband quit smoking a month before me may have helped. The fact that... My workplace went smoke-free about two months before that, and I had to smoke outside in a freezing cold Kansas winter may have helped. She started going through one after another and started seeing what had been going on that she had been the beneficiary of. So I think you're absolutely right. And because we don't learn from our successes, we can't fix our failures. So very important part of what we're trying to help advance. Looks like we're at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was great to spend time with you. Thank you. Thank you.